Good evening, everyone. It's so nice to have you all come to honor and learn from one of the most preeminent environmentalists in the world. Uh, I'm very lucky to know him and have known him for many years, but tonight you'll get a chance to hear about his most recent and I think important work. I'm speaking, of course, of Dr. Stephen Cohen. He is the Vice Dean of the School of Professional Studies. He's also a Professor of Practice in the School of Public Affairs here at Columbia, SEPA as we know it. He's the director of the Masters of Public Administration uh, in Environmental Science and Policy at SEPA. And he's also the director of the Master of Science in Sustainability Management in the School of Professional Studies. He also directs the Earth Institute's research program on sustainability policy and management. Just his title takes a full day's work. And he actually does the work. He, of course, has a PhD, as you well know, but he, you may not know that he was a Ford Foundation Fellow in Urban Environmental Policy. He was a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow in Public and Environmental Policy and Implementation. He previously served here at Columbia as the Executive Director of the Earth Institute, uh, and he's now a Senior Policy Advisor to the Institute. He served as a policy analyst and consultant to the Environmental Protection Agency. He's also worked on numerous boards and works on numerous boards to this day, including uh, the Pew Faculty Fellowship, the Executive Committee, and Accreditation Committee for the National Association of Schools of Public Affairs and Administration. He served on the advisory board of the EPA um, he's currently on the board of directors of Ho Homes for the Homeless and director of Wildan Group, which is a large public uh, corporation that does environmental uh, sustainability issues. He is the author, depending on how you count, of a dozen to 18 books that he's either authored or co-authored, half of them on environmental policy and sustainability and the other half on management. And he writes a weekly blog, which is a can't miss. Uh, I read it every Monday morning. You should too. Um, it's really useful. And I think the most important thing I can say about Steve is I had the pleasure of reading this book already several times. He not under not only understands why we've gotten into the position that we're now in, but how to fix it, and how to fix it in a reasonable, responsible way. Not that we all have to go back to candles and scratching for a living, that we can have all the benefits that we have in the world today just by doing things differently. And I think as importantly, the solution to these issues is not government alone, it's not the private sector alone, and it's not the nonprofit. It's all of the sectors working together. So this book is really fabulous. Uh, I, and I say that even though it sounds like I'm pandering, I'm not. Um, the first time I read it, I, I, I didn't put it down. I read the book from cover to cover. Um, and I think you'll find it that exciting as well. He's gonna be interviewed by Louise Rosen, so we're going to begin with a short film that will introduce you to the book, and then uh, the two of them will go at it. So thank you again for coming. You really made a wise decision. This is going to be a, a night that may change your life. The book is about how do we get from our current economy to a environmentally sustainable economy? How do we go from the linear economy of today where we chew up, spit out, and throw out all of our material possessions to what's called a circular economy where everything that goes in uh, eventually comes back and gets reused. I want to, in a very straightforward way, explain how we got into the environmental and sustainability crisis we're in today. I start by looking at what are the forms of pollution that we have what causes them. Then I turn to a strategy for 
addressing those uh, problems. And I conclude with the discussion of the politics of environmental sustainability. Environmental activists want people to do without. They want to punish people rather than trying to figure out ways of creating positive incentives for moving from the way we live today to the way we need to live to be in greater harmony with the planet. And so I focus on what's better about uh, having a renewable resource-based economy. Rather than focusing on just the issue of renewable energy, I like to focus on the issue of modernizing our energy system and trying to lower the price of energy rather than figuring out ways of taxing people so they move from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Fossil fuels have to be dug out of the ground or pumped out of the ground. That pollutes, that costs money. Then they have to be shipped. That pollutes and that costs money. And then they have to be burned. That pollutes and that costs money. Taking solar power and turning it into electricity is getting better and cheaper every year. We're going to see uh, more and more use of renewable energy. And it's going to get to the point where it's so much cheaper than fossil fuels that fossil fuels will be literally driven from the marketplace. We need to deal with people where they are instead of trying to convince them that they have to do without in order to save the planet. And I think the other issue that I raise in the book is the need to go back to the consensus politics of the 1970s, which is when all the great environmental bills were passed in the United States. And I think too much of our politics today is really about separating and polarization and showing how different and better we are than other people. And I think we have to go back to a politics uh, that talks about what we have in common. There's no reason to have the kind of ideological split we've had on regulation. Uh, instead, we can f develop, as we did uh, at the beginning of the environmental era, a consensus politics. Now, some people consider that naive. I consider it essential. And the way I always put it is we all like to breathe. It's one of those things we get used to. And we need to build a politics around that common need that we all have. Now you get to hear directly from the man who made the video. Louise, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bill. Steve, thank you for this opportunity to talk to you about this book. Um, uh, I think one of the things that grabbed me about this book and that you mention in the, the video is um, it's the can-do attitude and the optimism that carries from the first page through to the end. So what inspired this optimism and what enabled you to write this book at this moment in time? Thanks. You see the extremes they went to have me not do a lecture? <laughs> um, I, I think it really goes back to my first engagement with the environment. So it's the fall of 1975 and I wander into Les Milbrat's environmental policy class uh, and got interested in this, worked at EPA in the water and Superfund program in the late 70s. I realize that's four decades ago. And guess what? The air in America is cleaner today than it was in 1970. The water today is cleaner than it was in 1970. We got 40 million people out of pathways of exposure to toxic waste. Now, that didn't prevent East Palestine. It's not mm. the world's perfect. Public policy makes pro problems less bad. And the environment is less bad today than it was in 1970. Now, we, we have huge, important problems to address. But the question is, what is it that we did in the past that helped us solve these problems? And then how do we apply those solutions to what's going forward? And so the reason I'm optimistic is that I really believe that we've made progress um, and that we're going to continue to make progress. And I think that uh, one of the things that I say in the book is that uh, the transition to a renewable resource-based economy has begun. And like a lot of these transitions, when they start, uh, you don't notice them because you're still enmeshed in the problems of the old era. And I think that's part of what I'd say is uh, what keeps me optimistic about things. One of the things that, um, that you mentioned both in the book um, and that anybody who's reading the news at the moment can see that there's still degradation that's going on. 
Um, is the degradation that we're seeing today different to what we had seen previously? I mean, all of us were, were degrading with very little choice not to. Um, so what's driving it today? What are the main causes of it today if there's so much um, possibility to eliminate it? Well, at the beginning of the environmental era in the 70s, we had a little bit more than 4 billion people on the planet. Now we have about 8 billion people. And uh, <coughs> the uh, rate of, of consumption, of material consumption, has grown. Uh, so the question is, really, how do you take that consumption and build it in such a way that as you consume, you don't destroy the planet? And part of it is just good management. You know, uh, I taught a case study in class the other day about Cancer Alley, uh, which is a terrible set of chemical plants, uh, mostly in Louisiana. And the people running those plants should be ashamed of themselves because their management of those plants allows all sorts of toxics to escape unnecessarily. You don't have to poison the planet to make chemicals and plastic. It may be a little easier, it may be the way you know how to do it, but with a little bit of ingenuity, a little bit of uh, ecosystem uh, consciousness, you can actually fix it. And we have lots of examples of organizations that have done that. And so I think that's really the, the question is how do we become more mindful about our production and consumption so that as we produce and consume, we don't uh, destroy the planet? You, you know, we're, we're living in a time at the moment where there is just, it seems very difficult to be able to see relationships being bridged across the divide. It also, depending upon which publication you read or what radio station you listen to, government is evil, regulation is evil, and, and you're not saying that in this book. Why? Well, first, unfortunately, our politics is monetized difference. Um, you know, because of the way people raise money for interest groups, uh, you, you, you tend to paint your opponents as if they're evil and enemies. And so there's less of a drive to try to figure out what's common ground. And if you look at the beginnings of the environmental movements in the 70s, what's the largest environmental interest group in America. To this day, it's the National Wildlife Federation. The National Wildlife Federation was formed by and is still largely populated by hunters and anglers. Why do they care about the environment? Well, sort of like Teddy Roosevelt when he and John Muir were, were uh, trooping through the woods in California, he liked to shoot things. He liked to shoot animals. That was his thing. And so hunting uh, requires a certain amount of preservation. Okay. So what do they have in common with urban environmentalists who are vegans and are, are, can't believe people would wear fur or eat meat? Well, they all breathe, and they all want clean water. And so there's actually a point that we could agree with each other. And so our politics has to go to back to that kind of agreement. And climate change is the same way. Climate change, nobody wants to be underwater. Nobody wants to be in a planet with extreme weather all the time. So. You know, there's been this effort to, to delegitimize the science, in part because the solutions being proposed are so extreme. You know, the only way to solve uh, the climate problem is for us to not fly and not drive and sit alone in the dark with a candle. Well, you know, good luck in selling that. Uh, what I would rather sell is an energy solution where I say we're going to modernize the energy system. We're going to make energy less polluting less expensive and more technologically superior and reliable. And that's exactly what's happening right now. That's what we're at the beginning of doing. So that solution works on greenhouse gases much more effectively than trying to convince people to give up their lifestyles, which they're not going to give up. So, so much of environmental politics is this position taking and symbolic nonsense as opposed to trying to figure out a way how do we find out what's common so we can work on these problems and really solve them? And in the past, that's how we did it, and that's what worked. And I would like to go back to that. Now, uh, people tell me I'm naive and unrealistic, uh, but uh, like I said, everybody wants to breathe. It's sort of one of those things we do get used to. You're, I would never say that you were naive or unrealistic. Um, you're my boss. I would put it in a different in a different <laughs> way completely. Um, but one of the things that um, is very compelling also is, and just to pick up on what you just said, you mentioned the role of hunters, the role of anglers. 
You also, in the book, mention the need for organizations to take the lead um, and take, sorry, for organizations to follow the lead of equity and environmental justice. So, and this Genghis Khan-like approach of bringing the disparate tribes together, how does, that, how does that happen? And do you have any examples of that at the moment? Well, I looked at Mike Bloomberg when he was mayor of New York, and he brought the real estate industry and environmental justice advocates into the same room and said, you know, what is it that we need together as a city? So goals like everybody should be within a 10-minute walk of a park, uh, that when we build uh, new developments, some proportion should be set aside for um, you know, below market rents, uh, that we need to modernize our water system in building the third water tunnel, that we need to come up with congestion pricing and other ways of funding mass transit. It was early days, but I think since then he's been focusing a lot on, on renewable energy and advancing those technologies, but directing the benefits as much as possible uh, to people who are suffering the most uh, from environmental degradation, and those are largely communities of color and poor people. And uh, so we have this opportunity to rebuild the energy system. We could at the same time use that uh, opportunity to also fulfill some of the goals of the environmental justice movement. Do you think the government um, is better than at, at prohibiting pollution or fostering innovation? Well, interestingly enough, I mean, this, is, this was actually part of my blog this morning. Uh, it turns out that regulation inspires innovation. Now, I know that that's the opposite of the rhetoric, you know, job-killing regulation. But I use the automobile as the example. So, that, so Ralph Nader writes, unsafe at any speed. And the automobile company says, you've got to put us out of business by making us have seat belts. The same thing they said when we said you need catalytic converters and airbags and all the rest. So now what happens? Family goes to the showroom. And the salesperson says, this is a really safe car. It's worth the extra 1,000 bucks. And guess what? How much is my family's life worth to me? I think 1,000 bucks would cover it, right? So the, the point is that we've made environmental protection a kind of product. And that requires innovation. You know, it, I think about energy efficiency is probably the best example of this. You buy a modern air conditioner, and it uses 25% of the air conditioners from 20 years ago. But what happened? Well, the people that designed the air conditioner, the engineers, made energy efficiency a design parameter. Before they did that, it wasn't considered a design parameter, so they just, you know, who cares? It's just energy. And so by using human ingenuity, it inspires technology to make advances. And what happened with the automobile is a great example. After the engineers got finished with the uh, energy efficiency that they needed for mileage and pollution, they started to turn to other things. So now the motor vehicle uh, is a uh, mobile computer. There's much, many fewer mechanical parts. And now we're in the, era, in the, the dawn of the era of the electric vehicle, which is a, you know, when uh, the EPA last week proposed new uh, air regulation for emissions from motor vehicles, Tesla automatically qualifies because there's no emissions from their motor vehicles. So I, I think the point is the ideology of anti-regulation, which Ronald Reagan popularized, the idea that all regulation is bad for business, is simply not the empirical reality. Regulation uh, can actually be good for business. Now, there's lots of bad regulations that are administered poorly and badly thought through, and those are bad for everybody. And so one of the things I argue for is a more tailored, focused approach so that you can work with companies so they can get to compliance without being destroyed. I'd like to um, pick up on something you just mentioned from the point of view of the products that are created and how they're more efficient. But a byproduct of what's created is, is something that you talk about an awful lot and a topic that you're an expert on, which is garb waste. And, and you talk a lot I'm about heavily into garbage. You're heavily into garbage. I, I wanted to be respectful. Um, <laughs> we're recording this. Um, so you're optimistic and you're heavily into garbage. What's changed over the time that you've been <laughs> swimming in those well, topics? Well, I, I think we're heading toward the point that mining from our garbage will be less expensive than mining the planet. Now, that is a, a, a new way of thinking about this. But there are actually people working on applying robotics and artificial intelligence uh, to waste management. 
And, and to, to get to that point, we have to admit some of our failures. So recycling has largely been a failure. Admonishing people to separate their garbage and then developing individual markets for every product that comes out of the waste stream has not worked particularly well. Part of it is it's very expensive. Part of it is that the waste stream tends to be uh, contaminated. And so they're now, engineers are now working on single streams that then get separated using robotics and artificial intelligence. And you know, we all know that one of the transformative technologies of this part of the 21st century is going to be artificial intelligence. If you watched 60 Minutes last night, you saw some scary versions of it. But the idea here is that the planet itself uh, is the main place we now get our minerals from. But what if our garbage became the place we got our minerals and raw materials from? We already know how to do it with food. And, and with fertilizer, what about plastics, metals, and other uh, raw materials? It's not going to be here next week. But in the next 10 or 20 years, we're going to see that as commonplace. What if New York City spends $2 billion a year on collecting its garbage and sending it someplace to either burn or dump in a hole in the ground? What if a billion of that came back to us because we were able to sell the materials that we mined from our waste stream? Now, that might make for a pretty interesting uh, uh, change in the economics of waste. And New York City has the scale to do it. Now, of course, the politics of citing the, these technologies is something uh, that will be challenging, but I think it's feasible. You, you give a lot of examples of things that are possible. What's needed in order for us to realize that? What's missing now? Yeah, I, I think what's missing now is a little bit of confidence uh, that we can do this. Um, People are, you know, young people worry that the planet's coming to an end, that climate change is going to destroy us, that we've destroyed our planet and all the rest of that. Um, and part of it is, I think you need to look back at history at how economic transitions and technological transitions take place. I mean, how many of you knew, well, that, that were around 20 years ago, that we would have to carry computers with us wherever we went, and that this was actually more important than our wallets? Okay, or anything else. Okay, think about what happens when you lose your phone. It's like, you know, something horrible has happened to you. So we've we're, we've been in the midst of this technological transition. New York City is what I, I usually, usually use the physical dimensions of New York City as an example. New York City starts as a trading city. We traded uh, furs and agricultural uh, products from uh, the surrounding countryside. Uh, to, and we send it to Europe. So we're a, a trading city at first. In fact, we got so good at it, we built the Erie Canal, and we're able to get the entire Midwest to come through the port of New York instead of New Orleans, which would have been the natural place for stuff to come out of the Mississippi. We came to New York. So we're a trading city. Then in the 19th century, we became a manufacturing city, particularly toward the end of it. In fact, at its peak in 1950, New York City's clothing manufacturers made 95% of the garments worn in the United States of America, okay? We had half a million garment workers. Today, we have 150,000 people working in the garment industry. We now call it the fashion industry in New York. We make almost no clothing here, except for samples, but we design it and sell it. And we make much more money doing that than manufacturing 95% of America's clothing. So we, we have transitioned from a manufacturing city to a service city. We're now at the beginning of the transition from a service city to a renewable resource-based city. And what's the evidence of that? The local laws have been put in effect to try to change uh, our energy use, uh, what's going on to try to make us more energy efficient. The kinds of very slow transitions we're seeing in the energy sector and the renewable resource sector, it's not going to happen next week. This is a generation-long transition, but we're at the beginning of it. I can tell you, in the middle of the transition from manufacturing to services, everybody thought the city was going to come to an end. We lost a million jobs. People thought we were, you know, that was the end of New York. And somehow we reinvented ourselves as a service-oriented city with education, entertainment, <laughs> health care, and the rest. Now we're at the beginning of the transition to a renewable resource-based city and country, and I provide some examples at the end of the book of uh, places that are doing that. 
Who's responsible for fueling that? Is that coming from the technology from the private sector? Is that government? Who's, who's investing in this new future? I think, it's a, I think there's a bunch of things going on. Some of it's public policy pushing it uh, through uh, state and local governments, and then we see the Biden administration getting into it. We see uh, particularly uh, businesses starting to understand that they need to account for the risks uh, associated with environment. Uh, so I think the most important change that's about to happen, if you read the Wall Street Journal today, you would see that the uh, SEC is coming close to finally issuing its carbon uh, and uh, climate risk disclosure. Uh, this single regulation is going to have a massive impact on American corporations, who many of whom have been reporting voluntarily uh, on ESG issues, but now we're going to have to do it very specifically according to government rules. Now, those rules are going to be very preliminary. They're going to be challenged in court. They're going to change, but it's a lot like accounting in 1930s. You know, when we created generally accepted accounting practices uh, to get access to the public stock market, uh, we created the profession of accounting and chief financial officers. There were very few of those in the 1920s. So now we're going to be creating the position, and we have it in the federal government, it's starting in local government, starting in many businesses, of chief sustainability officers. That's being fueled by market forces, it's being fueled by public policy, and frankly, it's being fueled by young people who are coming into organizations and asking questions about environmental impact, uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, and governance issues, and uh, it's changing uh, the world. Now, you know, the, sometimes this gets criticized as somehow being woke. Uh, you know, well, I think woke is better than being asleep. And I think uh, these organizations are aware of their environment, and that's making a, a sea change in corporate governance. Um, I, you speak about Etsy in the book, you cover Apple, you cover Walmart, just, I, I think I mentioned this to you earlier, I, the, the weekend, this conversation, your book, your work in particular struck me as my eco-conservation team from Mattel arrived in my Walmart box. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a chief sustainability officer, Barbie. Um, and that made me think of how far we've come. Um, so you see a very strong role for the private sector, and you see the Walmarts of the world playing a, a role in, in the sustainability of our resources, and, and, and you call for a need for there to be a shift in how we talk about business. We, as environmentalists, talk about business. Can you talk about that a little bit, about how things have changed so much that they're now our stewards? Well, Walmart is the fastest adopter of solar power of any corporation in the United States. So why are they doing it? Uh, they're an Arkansas-based firm. Their clientele is not that concerned about climate issues. So they got into it because uh, they saw the profit in it. Solar power, uh, they have a lot of flat roofs on their buildings. You've probably seen these. And so they figured this is a good place to put solar arrays. And they're so rich, they'll recover the capital quickly and have cheaper energy. And they use a lot of energy in their stores. They also announced a couple of weeks ago that they're going to put charging stations uh, in their parking lots and gas stations. And why they do that? Well, while you're charging, you're going inside Walmart to buy some laundry detergent, you know. Concentrated laundry detergent, by the way, because they won't sell any other kind, because that makes them more money and less space. The point here is that uh, the idea that a uh, renewable resource-based economy is bad for business is empirically untrue. And businesses that are getting into this area are seeing it. And you know, that's, that's what I think is going on. I'm conscious of the fact that you and I could kibitz on this stage <laughs> all night about this. And I have to, um, have to give our audience time. But I have one more question I wanted to ask you. Um, and so I want to end our conversation with the beginning of the book, that you, don't, uh, you donate. You dedicate to your granddaughters. So what? does the world look like when your granddaughters become fresh women in college? Well, that will be 15 to 20 years from now, I guess, maybe 13 to 18 years from now, something like that. Uh, and I think this transition will be well underway. Um, I think that uh, you know, I did dedicate it to them because uh, I think that you know, Robert Hallbrenner wrote a postscript to his book, An Inquiry of the, to the Human Prospect. What has posterity ever done for me? So in pure economics term, 
in pure economic terms, the future doesn't matter. But it does matter. It matters to all of us because, you know, we care about what's coming next and what then the world our children and grandchildren will inherit. And so uh, I think that uh, we owe them, we owe these next generations enthusiasm, optimism, and a can-do spirit. That's how America got to where it is today. And that's really what gets us to the next place. And I think this pessimism and this polarization, and particularly this symbolic politics. At one point I talk about the symbolism that environmentalists uh, pursue sometimes, you know, this goal by 2030, this goal by 2040. Well, I want to look at what we're doing today and see how much better we can do next year rather than going for some aspirational target that may or may not be real. And I want to do it because I want my grandkids, by the time they're adults, to be in a planet where this pessimism has been wide, widely displaced by a more optimistic outlook. Thank you, Steve. I'd now like to invite members of the audience to uh, ask questions. So if you do have a question, please raise your hand, and one of our colleagues will bring a microphone to you. And I ask also that you ask questions, um, not give speeches. So who would like to? Who wants to raise their hand for the first, throw the first one out? Somebody over here, please. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Cheyenne Jodi. I'm an undergrad student studying environmental science, public policy, data science. I'm interested uh, because uh, as a young person myself, there's a lot of talk about, you know, as we transition towards a greener future, greener transition, how that is going to shape a lot of the predictions that have been made about rising sea level or rising temperatures. Like, is there a big impact that we will see as a result of us switching over to solar panel or wind farms here in New York, like if we have a transition like of, of the NYCHA houses to using solar panel, is it going to have a large impact on, on uh, like parts of Queens flooding or parts of Manhattan, like some of the coastlines? Thank you. Well, one of the issues with climate change, and this is why its politics are so difficult, is it's created everywhere, and its impact, at least up until now, was largely in the future. Now, fortunately, our models 20 years ago did predict exactly what's going on. So we do know this is, this is happening. Um, I think that what we're going to see and what we've started to see is the beginnings of this technological transition, which will uh, have an impact all over the world, but it's going to take a while before we see it. We're going to have another 20 years of uh, increasing heat and increasing uh, extreme weather, uh, more sea level rise. And so the immediate priority is going to be on adaptation, making sure that we create more resilient cities. Now, New York has spent billions of dollars already to do that. Con Edison, you know, the plant that once was underwater during Hurricane Sandy is now pretty weatherproof. Most developers in New York are not putting their new utility rooms in the basement. They're putting it up on the third floor. And lots of people that live close to the shoreline have raised their houses on stilts knowing that the waters are going to come. So we're, we're going to have to get better at this. Uh, but then some of the impacts, like you know, uh, after Ida, the five inches of rain in one hour that, that flooded people's basements, uh, that's going to take different kinds of solutions. The, the good news in New York City is you don't have to convince people. People know there's a problem and they're willing to get together to try to help solve it. Again, it's not perfect. I, shouldn't, I don't want to give the impression that everything's easy and everything's perfect. This stuff is hard. And like I said, public policy is about making problems less bad. Uh, we're not going to solve these problems, but we're going to make them less bad. And I think one of the reasons that's going to happen is that these transitions are underway. I mean, the one that I'd point to that I think is really picking up steam, if you will, is the electric vehicle. Uh, the, the electric vehicle is coming, and it's coming very, very fast, uh, much faster than people thought it was going to. And part of that subsidies, and part of that is the business community has put billions of dollars into it seeing the handwriting on the wall. So that is going to be another thing we're going to see. And the other thing I hope we see in New York City is that we finally get congestion pricing and we improve the subways so that people want to ride on them and that they're more convenient and uh, come more often. Thank you. Next question. We have somebody's hand over, over here. Thank you very much. And it's a wonderful uh, book. It sounds like, and I would like to read it. 
I had one quick question that would atomic energy and uh, would that have a place in the way you are thinking about it and how would it fit because it may be another way to think about all of this. Sure. Um, the, the unfortunate history of nuclear power is we took the wrong form of it. Uh, and it really goes back to Ike and Adams for Peace. Uh, we don't want a nuclear power that can contaminate and create bombs. Uh, and that's what fission is. Had we put the money into fusion or other forms of nuclear power, we'd be much further along. I do think that nuclear is a long-term solution, but in the short term, I would quote Barry Commoner, who said, nuclear power, it's a hell of a complicated way to boil water. And so I think that, that the technology of using uh, some form of nuclear power, yes. The form we have, no. And all of the people that talk about that, I mean, look at what's going on right now in Ukraine. Now, do you really want to have the possibility of a nuclear plant bombed and melting down? Uh, or terrorists taking over. You know, one of the points that I, I make in the book, which I, I should have made here, is that uh, one of the reasons we need economic development is that political stability requires it. And so if the poor, extreme poor people of the world don't see hope, and if the people living uh, prosperous lives think that they're going to lose it, uh, then you have political instability. If you have political instability, you have terrorism. Today, the, the, with the technology of destruction, the trade-off is it's a little sea level rise or a dirty bomb in Times Square. I'll take the sea level rise. Now, in the long run, I don't want either of them. But I think we need to understand the connection between economics and politics and environment. And this is one system. And the idea that you could pull something out and say, let's shut down the economy so there's no greenhouse gases uh, is a dangerous idea and one that's been rejected by uh, politics for good reason. Thank you. Next question. We have someone back on the right side this time. Thank you very much for your efforts. Um, looking at the, the electric vehicle, there's a major problem which I'd like you to address. The fact that there's several billion petroleum-based engines in the more than 190 countries of the world, most of which do not produce these vehicles but import them secondhand. And of course, the, the electric car is great, but you have to ask yourself, where does the electricity to run it come from? Okay. If it comes from a coal-fired factory, it's a self-delusion. Okay. So how do you address, in the time frame possible, the replacement of those several billion petroleum-based vehicles without transforming them? Because obviously, they can't be replaced by uh, electric cars within the, the time frame that we're talking about, which is 10 years or less. Well, that's why the, the goal of 10 years is probably unrealistic. We're talking about a generation-long change. And we're going, to have fossil, we're going to have internal combustion engine vehicles for a long time. The question is, uh, what's going to be the mix? And also, as you said, how many of those uh, electric vehicles will be, will be powered on solar energy versus uh, fossil fuels? So I think in order for us to get off of the fossil fuels in transportation, we have to get to the electric vehicle. In order for that transition to be helpful to the environment, we have to get to renewable energy. So these are two separate transitions that have to take place uh, simultaneously. And sure, all of the old cars that nobody here is going to use will go to other markets. And it's going to take a long time before all of this goes away. Uh, I think part of the transition is when solar energy and the batteries uh, that store it becomes so inexpensive and so technologically superior that uh, it's literally so much less expensive than fossil fuels that your old internal combustion engine vehicle is really not worth maintaining because the electric vehicle is cheaper and better. And this is not an instant transition. I mean, the electric vehicles now are expensive, charging is inconvenient, and a lot of the electricity is coming from fossil fuels. But you've got to make all these changes, uh, and you have to start somewhere. And I think the, one of the biggest and most difficult transitions is going to be the vehicles themselves. But you know, there's other forms of greenhouse gases, by the way, besides uh, you know, uh, carbon dioxide. And we have to work on those, too. Thank you. I, we have time for another question. And this will be the last one. Thank uh, you. Hi. Uh, you mentioned that there'll be more uh, CSO roles in organizations. 
what would the skill set of a great CSO look like? Well, you either get the Master's in Sustainability Management, <laughs> the Master's of Sustainability Science, or the MPA in Environmental Science and Policy. You could do the MA in Climate Society if you weren't that analytically oriented or management oriented. That would help, too. Uh, Columbia offers a vast array of, 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 of degrees, uh, most of which I spent most of my academic year trying to sell. So uh, I think we have some of those. Uh, but I think the, that uh, a lot of the today's sustainability professionals had to retool themselves. Uh, they didn't have the formal education that we offer here. And they've made an incredible start in getting this underway. In fact, many of those same people teach for us as practitioners because they have so much to offer. So those would be the skill sets. Anyway, thank you all for coming out tonight. Thank you, Steve.